Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. You know, last Sunday, last Sunday night, Beth and I, we, we went to, be, to bed and we went to sleep and everything was normal. And then when I go out to, to our car, our garage door is locked, which we don't normally do, but we sometimes do. So that's kind of weird. And then open up our, our garage and our garage door is wide open. And I was like, oh, this is kind of weird, but I got to get to work. So I get in my car and I started and I get, head to work. And a few hours later, I get a phone call from Beth. She's like, hey, did you notice anything weird uh, this morning when you went into the garage? I was like, yeah, the, the garage door was open. She's like, yeah, because the, the garage door opener was stolen out of our van in the front of our house. And uh, she's like, I, I'm, I was trying to get into our garage because she had parked it out front. And so she's like, shoot. So she goes to the back to think, okay, like maybe they, people got into our garage, they stole our garage open, or maybe they stole something. And she goes into our garage and realizes that, yeah, somebody had gone into our garage Sunday evening while we were sleeping about three in the morning and, and stole some stuff out of our garage. And we went on, to, on our, you know, community Facebook page. Maybe you have on a community group. And there was a lot of people who had their garages, their cars. We had people who had their trucks stolen all in our community. Uh, on Sunday night, and Beth calls me. She's like, hey, uh, there's a few things that have been taken. And the first thought was like, I hope my golf clubs haven't been taken, right? That was literally my first thought. That's my most expensive thing in my garage. They might be worth more than my car. I don't know. They're not. <laughs> yeah, I promise you they're not. I was just joking. Um, and she finds out that, yeah, my drill and my impact had been stolen. Now, what's funny about it is that I had like a Mastercraft drill and uh, an impact, and I've had them for like 10 years and they barely worked when I got them. And now they barely worked even more. And so they had come in and they'd taken my broken impact and my broken drill. And they had also taken our Coleman stove and that's all that we know they stole. Maybe there's more, right? You think about your garage, like how many things you have in your garage that like if they got stolen, you might not notice until you need it one day, which is maybe in five years, right? So I don't know, maybe they took more, but that's what they took from our garage. And so Monday, this was Monday morning, I get this call. And so on, on Monday, I was like, I'm going to make the most manly decision I could ever make. I'm going to go buy myself a new drill. This is a true story. Because I was like, every time I've moved, they're like, hey, do you have like a drill they could use? I pull out my Mastercraft. They're like, I'll probably use my hand instead, right? Like for real, right? It's like, do you have a butter knife, right? Like, I'll use that instead. And so I went and I bought myself a, a new drill and I bought a DeWalt drill. And yeah, like I'm telling you, I, I, I went up to the cashier and I'm like, look what I'm buying, you know what I mean? Like, look at me. Will I use it? I don't know yet, okay? I'm not sure if I'll use it, uh, but that's not actually true because yesterday, this is just like a long story, but yesterday, uh, Beth and I were given a, a really old barbecue that, we, that we're told works. We're not quite sure if it does. Um, you know, one of those barbecues, you're like, it might work if it's like sitting in a certain position, right? Like, that's what it's like. And one of the legs is like falling off of it, and so I pulled out my drill and I grabbed a piece of wood and I screwed a piece of wood as a brace between the two legs. I'm telling you, I was like, I might build a house next, right? Like I was like, I might be, I might extend my deck. Like, I don't know. And if you know me, I, you were like, how did you even know how a drill worked, right? That might be your thoughts. Cause like, I had the same thought. I was like, I think I could fix this. And then I tried and I was like, I think I fixed it. Now, will it stay? I don't know. Okay. I don't know if it's actually going to work properly. But that's kind of what this week looked like for us is, is Sunday all the way through today is just we, we got things kind of stolen out of our garage. And I don't know if you've ever had something stolen from you, like something from your garage or from your car or your wallet, whatever. It's, it's not a fun feeling, especially when you know like somebody was like in your space, like in your house. Like it's not a feeling that you enjoy. And uh, today we're going to continue on in our series uh, called Summer Highlights. And we're going to be going through this one verse and I'm going to share some context about it, but John chapter 10, verse 10. This is a very famous scripture um, that, we, that, that we love to talk about and, and we love to see. And this is what it says in John 10, 10. says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And it says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is a verse we love. Right, because it kind of shares the, 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 the contrast between the thief and the Savior. Say, it, it shares the contrast between death and life, right? This, this thief comes to kill, right? And Jesus says, I came to give them life. So there's this beautiful contrast of death and life. 
And as we love this verse, because I think it brings us hope in the midst of our broken world, in the midst of our crisis, in the midst of our tragedy, in the midst of our chaos, this verse can almost be a beacon of hope in our life, knowing that God still is there for us and he is already given us life. That no matter what else goes on, we still have life. And that he, how often when we look around us, there's so many things going on, but we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and know that he is the anchor, that he is actually the provider for life. He's the one who actually provides us with everything that we need, a life that cannot be taken away, that the thief will come and try and take it, and, and we, it can't be taken away because it's everlasting life. It's not just life here on earth, it's everlasting life. And this verse comes kind of in the middle of a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And Jesus is telling them, he's just telling them, this is who I am and this is what I'm going to do. This is who I am to you. And so John chapter 10, verse 1, we're going to be reading this together. It says this, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door by the, uh, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. For why? Because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. And verse 6, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. I, th I find that's funny that John added that in. Because John's like, none of us understood at all what he was talking about. Like, why are you talking about a robber going into a sheep pen? Like, we don't fully understand what's, what you're saying. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. He says, I am the door if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and, and, and out and find pasture. And then verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know, this is a powerful part of scripture and there's so much um, in this uh, that, that we can think about, that we can see uh, in this scripture. And I don't have time to go through you know, all the verses today. But when we go to John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That we see again this contrast between death and life. That the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus is saying, I came to give them life. And not just like life, like to give them good life, like abundant life. Some verses say like to give them like, like great life, right? Like this is what this is saying is this contract and the, the contrast between a thief and a shepherd. You know, oftentimes when we read this, we view the thief as the enemy, as the devil, as, you know, that's how we read it. But really in the context of what Jesus is saying is, is, is less about the spiritual thief. He's talking more about the, the earthly thieves around them in the, con in the context of their culture. He's really talking about a thief in the earthly realm that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And while the Lord walked on earth, there are many leaders of the Jews that sought to steal his position and kill the son and, and, and heir of God and scatter the flock and steal all that was his, right? If you read through the New Testament, how many times are the leaders of the synagogues, how many times are the leaders of the time, the, the Pharisees, right? They're, they're the ones who actually kind of break things apart. They didn't fully understand who Jesus was, and if you know, this is exactly what we see is happening in our culture today. We're seeing so many people falling away. We're seeing so many people leaving the church. We're seeing so many people who not just are leaving the church. There's a lot of people right now who, who hate the church. Like not just like, they just like, oh, I don't go to church anymore. It's like, I, I despise the church. That's what we're seeing happening in culture. People trying to scatter the flock and to, to spread lies. And there's so many things happening. You see this in Pakistan just this past week and last week. In Pakistan, I don't know if you've seen this, there, there, there are so many Christian churches being burned right now. And mobs are coming and burning the church. People hate the church. 
So it's not just an issue that was happening in Jesus' time. We're seeing this happen today. The same thing that the, that the thief is coming to try and steal, kill, and destroy. Whether we think about that as the physical thief or we think about that as our, the spiritual thief, right now as believers, as the church, there's this attack coming after us that's been happening for decades. It's been happening for centuries. So what Jesus is saying here isn't just talking about their culture. It's actually what's happening, I believe, today in our own culture. Because I think in our culture, we've become so consumed by everything that we can attain. We're so consumed by trying to create our own life, the good life. If we see what the good life is, really, when we think of culture, it's all about money. It's all about, it's all about status. It's all about position. It's all about what we can do. It's all about influence. We even have careers now that they're called influencers, right? They get paid a lot of money to have ads on social media. This is what we see as the good life often is, is this things. But we become so consumed by it, I believe, even in my own life, I sometimes get so consumed by, by everything that I, my eyes start to shift away from the one who actually is the one who provides the good life. The one who actually is the one who, who, will, who will bring the life. That so many things are trying to distract me or take me away from what God is trying to do in my life. They're trying to steal it away from me. And I have to keep my eyes fixed and focused on Jesus. Now, I want to go through three uh, things today that I think um, right now, the thief, however you want to view that. But our culture, if you want to even put our word, the, the culture comes the enemy comes, the thief comes. Three things that I believe the thief is trying to do in our lives. And number one, I think that we're seeing this really deeply right now is that the thief is coming to try and steal our relationships. You know, how much division do we see right now <laughs> just in our own families? How, many, how much division do we see now right even between couples? How much division do we see right now between churches and denominations and leaders and pastors and Politicians, so much division right now. And I think that's what the enemy tries to do. The thief, our culture, whatever you want to say, comes to try and steal our relationships. You know what I think one of the biggest things the thief does to steal from us is to get us so busy that we don't have time for the most important people and the most important things in our life. I think that the thief, the enemy, our culture, tries to tell us that if we aren't busy, that means we're not successful. That if we're not busy, that means we're lazy. But I also think it's the opposite. Is that some of us, we've gotten ourselves so not busy. All we do is rest. We take a Sabbath every day of the week. That's a problem as well. That's going to steal your relationships. I think about my life. Maybe you can think about your life. Maybe you've had a conversation. You know, oftentimes I'll ask someone, right, how are you? And they're like, I'm busy and I'm tired. That's the two biggest responses I see. It used to be that we would just try and fake and be like, I'm good. Now it's like, I'm busy. And then we're like, I'm so proud of you. Good for you. Good for you. You're tired? That means you're working hard. What our culture, culture is telling us is that busyness and tiredness, tiredness are supposed to be just the way life is. That we're supposed to be busy, we're supposed to be tired. I don't know how many conversations Beth and I have right now because, like, our kids don't sleep well and, like, all these things. How many conversations, like, how are you? I'm so tired. I'm tired. I'm, we're, and it's like, you're busy, but we're still so tired. That sometimes we get to the end of the day when our kids finally get to sleep and we're like, finally have a moment to connect. And then two minutes later, we're both just passed out on, on our bed. It's like 9.15. We're like, wow, you know. <laughs> just kidding. I don't fall asleep at 9.15. That's been a long time for me that that happened. Maybe you're like a 915 person, like, good for you, you know. But how often do we say that? I'm so busy, I'm so tired. We're conditioned to believe we need to live in a constant state of busyness and exhaustion. Each day that just blends into the next. If we aren't busy or tired, something's wrong. You ever met somebody who's just so full of energy and it's got kind of weird? You're like, how are you? They're like, let me tell you about all the beautiful, amazing things in my life. You're like, man, having this conversation with you made me tired. Ever had people like that? I believe, I truly believe that, that we're not supposed to live in a constant state of busyness and exhaustion. 
I don't, I don't believe that that's the way we're supposed to be, that just busyness is supposed to be our life. We're always supposed to be busy. And if we're not doing something, then we're lazy. I think the enemy, this thief, is trying to steal our relationships. You know, when I think about my life, I think about my, my daughter. She just turned three years old. And I was thinking about how many summers I have with her when she's living at home. It's 18. 18 summers, maybe. And she's already gone through th three of them. And I'm like, man, I'm running out of time and she's only three. Now, maybe you don't think that way. That's just the way my mind goes. I'm like, man, how much time am I spending on so many other things that in 15 years, I'm not even going to remember why I did it. I'm not even going to remember that I did it. But I think I'm going to look back maybe sometimes and think how much time did I waste not spending time with the most important people because I thought being busy was actually the good life when in reality, it's not about busyness. It's about purpose. Just because you're busy doesn't mean you're living a life of purpose. It doesn't mean you're actually living the life God created you to live. I don't want to waste my time with my family because I'm tired. I can't tell you how many times I come home from work. I'm tired. But then I think about I was up before my kids, and my kids are going to go to bed in maybe an hour and a half, two hours. I have maybe two hours a day that I can spend with my kids, and sometimes I spend it all on my phone. I spend all my time on social media or whatever it is. I'm like, man, like, why am I wasting so much of my time? Because I think that if I can get preoccupied and distracted, that it's, that's what's going to finally bring me rest. I think this is why God made an effort to bring rest into our schedule. If you read in Genesis 2, verse 2 to 3. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work he had done in creation. You know, some of us, we love following the commands. We love following what Jesus has, talked to, has told us to do. We like listening to his voice. But as soon as he's like, yo, it's time to take some rest, we're like, I can't. I don't have time to rest. I don't have time to take time off. I don't have time to go spend a week with my family when I don't have to go to work. I don't have time in my schedule for it. And I think if God had time in his schedule for it, I probably should too. Do we think God like physically needed to rest on the seventh day? I don't, I, I don't think so. He, I think he did this because he knew that we needed it desperately. Do you have time in your life where you set aside daily and weekly and monthly and yearly to get away from the busyness and get away from it all? Do you actually create space? And I'm not talking about just not sleeping. I'm talking about do you create space to spend one-on-one -on -one time with your kids? Do you spend, take space and time to spend one-on-one -on -one time with your spouse? Do you take space to spend one-on-one -on -one time with your Savior? And I was researching some of the biggest reasons why people get divorced in culture, number one is a lack of communication. You know, and the next, the, I think the second one was there's no more intimacy in the relationship. You know, number three was uh, we fell out of love. When I think about that, those are the three main reasons that people share. And it breaks my heart. That we haven't invested enough time into our relationships because we've invested our time other places. I think that's one thing the thief tries to do is steal our relationships. And then number two that I think the thief is trying to do in our life is to kill our joy. I think a lot of us have more worry and anxiety in our lives than we have joy. We have a lot more things in our life to be anxious about, worried about, than we have to be grateful for and we have to be joyful about. You know, if you, make, if you try to make a list of all the things that bring you joy in your life, I think for some of us, the list of what we're anxious about would be way longer. We have to, we can't let our worry become more powerful than our joy. Because worry is powerful. Anxiety is powerful, right? It is. You ever get around someone who's worried all the time and all of a sudden you're like, you're like wow, yeah, I need to. I'm worried now too, right? Like it, 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 it can spread, but joy can as well. Joy can spread. 
And you know, as believers, as, as, as followers of Jesus, I think we're supposed to be carriers of joy. Spreading joy, not spreading anxiety. Spreading love and hope and joy into the world. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, says this. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, I've been in church a long time, and I know there's been moments where I'm sitting in church on a Sunday morning. I have this moment, this opportunity to worship, and all I'm thinking about is what I'm going to do tomorrow at work. Now, maybe, maybe that's where your mind is too, right? Like, this is what happens is we get so focused on what's happening tomorrow, what's happening next, what's, what's going to happen next, so we get so caught up in that that we forget to actually be present in the day we're in now. In the moment we're in now that we get this opportunity every Sunday to come together as a community, as a family, and worship our creator together. But oftentimes our minds are on other things. They're on the wrong things. Our eyes are fixed and focused on the wrong things. And so what happens is we feel like, why am I not joyful? How come I don't smile? How come I barely am laughing? I know there's a lot to be worried about, but I also think there's a lot to be grateful for. It just depends where you look. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think a lot of us, we live our life and we're anxious about everything and we pray about nothing. We're anxious about everything, worried about everything. That's not how we were created to live. No wonder we're so tired. No wonder we're so exhausted. What do you do for fun in your life? What do you do for fun with your family? And I'm not just talking about like putting on a show and trying to get a couple of extra minutes in the morning at 5 a.m. when your kid's awake. But what do you do to bring joy into your life and enjoy into the lives of our children, into our community? What do you do to bring life and joy? Because I think the thief is, is going to try and put doubt in your mind, to bring anxiety in your life. But we need to be pursuers of this peace that's promised in this verse. Pursuers of this peace. And how do we find this peace? It's like a list. It's like through prayer and thanksgiving. Through prayer and gratitude. We have to be people who pray. We have to be people who are grateful and filled with thanksgiving. You know, on, on, on when our stuff was stolen, like Monday was like a weird day. Like, like I don't know, like not that it like wrecked my day because it's just things and I don't really, it was like a master craft drill. You know what I mean? Like I'm not like, I'm not like, oh my gosh, they got my drill. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, like it's so bad for them, right? Now they got to throw it out, right? It's tough. But I remember just sitting there and being like, man, this sucks, Right? This is, this sucks. My life sucks. Why did we, why did they get into our van? How did that happen? I started to feel sorry for myself. And I, I was thinking, I was like, I, I can't let this ruin my day because I lost something that had a little bit of value. You know, I think for a lot of us, when something comes up, it's unexpected it can ruin our entire week or our entire year or our entire month because this thing happened and the injustice that went on. We got to start praying about everything and be anxious about nothing. We have to be grateful and be filled with prayer. We have to be people who pray and people who are grateful. And I think our focus has to be less on what we don't have and more on what we do have. Put your focus on the things you already have. Yes, you know, you can dream and you can plan and you can start to 
build something better, but that also starts with a place of gratitude. And then the last thing I think that the thief is trying to do, and there's many more, but these are just three that I think are really prevalent in our culture and our society. Number three is he, he's trying to, or the thief is trying to destroy our future. I think a lot of us, our, our past is really what has defined and created the future and the place we're living today. And so we're, we're so ashamed, we're so full of regret, we're so full of worry or anxiety or tiredness, whatever, that we think that's where we're supposed to live. But I think really what the future is, is what you do now. Not what you did yesterday. If you want to build the future, if you want to live the life God's created you to live, it's, not, it's more about what you do now than what you did yesterday. So the future's not going anywhere. You're just getting closer to it, right? We're the ones moving. You know, the thief could be pressure from the work, from the world to work a certain job or to get a certain degree. It could be, the thief could be addiction that no one knows about, yet it haunts you every day. The thief could be the voices speaking, telling you you're not good enough and you can't do it. You're not educated enough. You know, I think one of the biggest things facing us today is we I think we're one of the most insecure cultures I, that I've seen, not that I've seen all cultures, but we're very insecure. We're insecure about what people think. We're always trying to impress each other. We're insecure about our own abilities, even though God gave them to us for purpose. We're so insecure about them that we're not actually willing to train ourselves and to build and step into the future. We're insecure about our relationships, always wondering if, if, if the person we're in relationship with is doing something behind our back or gossiping about us or saying things about us. We're just so insecure. And the thief uses insecurity to destroy our futures. Because we don't realize who we are and who God says we are. We don't realize. We know the first part of the verse, steal, kill, and destroy. But that's not where we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live in the life that God came and gave us. That's where we're supposed to live. We have to be secure in who God says we are. The promises he has for us. But this is the things that the thief wants to do. And there's more. But I want to give you the good news. I want to give you the solution. The answer is that there's hope and Jesus came. The solution to the problem. He says, this is what the thief's going to do. He's going to try and get into the pen. He's going to try and get you out. But do you know the voice? Do you know my voice? So the question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to this word life is, how do we define life? What does this word life actually mean? What life? It's such a broad thing, right? Life. What does it mean to have the abundant life? Again, I think culture tells us it's all about what we have. It's all about how much we make. It's all about the house we live in. It's all about the car we drive. It's all about the health in our life. That's what culture tries to tell us. It's all about that. In the book of John, uh, we see the word life appear 47 times in 39 verses, this word life. And it's two different words from the original language Greek of what it means. One would be a verb and one would be a noun. But each time in John where the word life used in this same context of chapter 10, verse 10, is, is this word life uh, that, that is in reference or talking about more eternal life. Talking about br the broader picture than just here today. It's talking about more than just the earth we live in, not just talking about the life we live here, but talking about the everlasting life that's promised. And we see it used a bit later in John chapter 11. And this comes in the context of one of his great friends, Lazarus, is dead. One of Jesus' great friends. And he's with his sisters, Martha and Mary. And Martha, she's complaining to Jesus, right? She's complaining. Jesus, you didn't make it in time. If only you'd come earlier, what took you so long? Maybe some of the questions we ask Jesus, the same questions. If only you would come sooner. If only you had provided sooner, then I wouldn't be in this mess. If only you had come earlier, he'd still be alive. And Jesus explains that Lazarus will rise again. Mary, they're confused. They're like, yeah, he's going to rise again in the, in the, like at the end, but like, what about now? 
And then Jesus says this in, in, in John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Is the question he asks to them. Do you believe this? He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. That's who he is. The life we're longing for doesn't come from anything we can attain. It doesn't come from what we build on earth. It doesn't come from any of those things that the life promised. It's not about health and wealth. It's just about knowing God. That the life we, we live, the, the, the abundant life is knowing God. And in, in, in John 5, 24, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. He whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has this life as promised. This verse really brings us back. It's a little later, John 10, 10. It says, I came to give them life to bring back to bring breath back into their lungs. To raise the dead things inside of them to life. To move them from death to life. From death to freedom, from death to peace, from death to joy. This eternal, abundant life that can never be taken. The thief's gonna try and come, but he can't. Why? Because if you read through in the beginning, the sheep know his voice. Now some of us, we're living our life as if we're new to the uh, sheep pen. We're new to the pasture. We don't know the voice yet. We have questions of how do I get to know his voice? I'm going to tell you, it's not going to come from going to a conference. It's not going to come from going to whatever it is. You know where, how you're going to know his voice? Is intimacy with him. You're not going to get it just from have, going to an event. You're going to get it by spending intimate time in his presence. I hear people say, how do I know when it's God speaking? <clears throat> and I always say, Bring it back to Scripture. Is what God is saying lining up with what the Bible says? Do you know what the Bible says? Do you know the promises? Do you know them? I think so many of us in life, we're so scared to die. We're so scared to fail. We're so scared to mess up that we never try anything new. that we've, we, we have the life that God has promised, we're holding it, but we're not actually living it out. We'll have to live a life filled with purpose and passion, but also rest. Rest for your souls, that's what Jesus said. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. The life here is really is just a promise of God. That the thief or the enemies of our world are trying to get us. But one thing that can never be taken away from us is our relationship with Jesus, right? They can't take away the beauty of the scriptures that we have written on our hearts and on our minds. And you hear stories coming out of some of these places across the world where they can't have access to Bibles. What do they do? They memorize them. So that even if they take them away, they still have life inside of them. You know, the enemy may steal, but Jesus always provides. The enemy may try and come and kill, and he'll do it, yet Jesus saved us. The enemy may destroy, yet we're protected by the good shepherd. In John 10, 11, it says, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for my sheep. comes through relationship with Jesus, with our good shepherd. We know his voice through practice. 
We know where he is leading and we trust him. We love him and we dedicate our lives to him. You know, our takeaway today is this, is that Jesus abandoned his life for us to have abundant life. He abandoned it all, all of it. So that way we could have this life promise in John 10, 10. Lay down his life for his sheep. He abandoned it for our sake, for you and for me. He is the life. Nothing else can satisfy. Nothing else can quench our thirst. Nothing else can fill us. He is the resurrection and life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Over and over and over again, I am the life. No matter what we go through, no matter the attacks we feel or the storms or the chaos, we have to remember that we're holding on to Jesus and we're holding on to life. I don't know where you're at when it comes to life. I don't know if worry and anxiety have a hold of you. I don't know if busyness is really how you just live because you think that's how you have to live. I don't know where you're at. But I want to encourage you always remember that Jesus loves you deeply. He cares deeply about you. And he laid down his life for you. And we trust him. And we step into his arms. And we let him lead us. We let him guide us. We let him take us to places we could almost never have imagined. So, Father, we thank you for today. We come to you and we lay down our anxiety. We lay down our worry. We lay down our stress. We lay it down at your feet. And, God, we pray that you teach us how to rest. You teach us how to take time in relationship and intimacy with you. That you teach us not to let busyness take over. But how we do learn to rest. God, I pray that you help us not be scared of the future that you're building, but help us walk with you and create it with you. To not be afraid to do things and to try things, not be afraid of failure. But know that even if we fail, even if we stumble, even if we fall down, you're going to pick us back up and we can keep on going. So God, I pray that today as we head into this new school year, as we head into September, as we head into this new year, this new season, God, I thank you that you are building your church, that you're building us up as your followers and God, help us not be afraid of the good news. Help us not be ashamed of the gospel. But help us be willing to bring it wherever we go. In Jesus' name.